everybody. Welcome to Siren's uh, webinar today. We're very excited to have you all here. And I think in a second we'll have some slides up. Um, but welcome. We'll be talking today about the role of the healthcare sector in addressing adverse social drivers of health. We're gonna give folks a mi few minutes to come in because I see participants. Oh, you can't hear me, okay. Uh, Dylan, can you hear me? Can others hear me? I can hear you. Okay, great. That yeah, okay. looks like a lot of other people can hear you. Okay, wonderful, great. Well, welcome everybody. We're giving folks just a few uh, seconds to join us because we have a lot of people who had registered and so there may be a little bit of an electronic bottleneck getting in, but we're really excited today to have you all here to have a conversation around the healthcare sector's role in addressing social drivers of health. We know that there's a lot uh, going on in this space right now, a lot of incentives from various um, federal, national organizations like CMS, NCQA, the Joint Commission. Um, we have uh, a number of states that are funding, uh, using Medicaid funds to pay for social services. Um, and I think there's a lot of questions about where exactly the boundaries should be of what the healthcare sector's role should be in addressing adverse social drivers. So let's go to the next slide want to just let you know that our webinar is being recorded and you will get a copy of it after the fact. So um, don't worry about not uh, being able to catch everything. You'll have an opportunity to listen to it again. We also very much welcome your questions and the way to uh, ask questions is through the Q&A feature, not the chat. So please put questions in the um, Q&A and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. Next slide. Before we delve into today's content, we wanna give you a preview of some of our future events. So first on March 11th, we'll be having another webinar about Siren's new conceptual model. If you haven't yet registered for it, this QR code will take you to the registration page for that webinar. Then in April, we'll have a webinar about the lessons from the Camden Coalition's Care Management, RCT. We're very excited about that. And then um, if you didn't read this in our newsletter last week, we want to announce that in a year, in February of 2025, we'll be holding the next Siren National Research Meeting. We're really excited about this. We're very grateful to Kaiser Permanente for the support that is making this planning possible. Um, we're currently looking for additional sponsors for the meeting. So if any of you know of any organizations that would like to be associated with this meeting, please have them get in touch with us. Great, and now let's go to introducing our panelists. We're very excited today to have three distinguished panelists um, joining us for this conversation. So first, uh, Seth Berkowitz, who's Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of North Carolina School of Medicine. Second, um, Sherry Gleed, who's Dean and Professor of Public Service at the NYU Wagner School of Public Service. And third, Stacey Lindau, who's Catherine Lindsay Dobson, Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology and Professor of Medicine at the University of Chicago School of Medicine. Um, wanna let you know that we do have in the slide deck, go to the next slide, um, the disclosures for each of um, our panelists. Um, next slide, please. We're not gonna go over them, but they will be in the slide deck um, and the recording that you receive after this call. Great. So let's go to our conversation. Um, I'd love to start off. So uh, part of the impetus for this conversation um, was a piece, Sherry, that you published last August. It was kind of a provocative piece, I think, on purpose, um, arguing um, that the healthcare sector should not be playing such a big role in social sector initiatives or services. Um, could you start off by telling us what motivated you to write that piece and, so, and what you were trying to convey? So actually, there was a, a moment that that was sort of the motivation of it, which was that some colleagues of mine were working on something um, around the role of social determinants in pediatric care. And somebody called me and said, what happens in Europe? Like, how do they connect um, 
you know, how do the health, how does the healthcare sector provide social services in European countries? And I called a colleague in Europe and he said, we don't do that. And I thought, wow, that's really interesting. Why have we gone down that path when those countries aren't doing it at all? And so I got to thinking about the question and about what we're trying to do. Um, so, you know, let me start by being really clear. The evidence suggests it would really be a great idea to rebalance our spending in the U.S. away from health, where we spend a huge amount of money, and towards social services, where we don't spend enough money. That would be a very good case, very good situation. I, I, I remember in the very my, one of my first experiences with the U.S. healthcare system was seeing that we spent a lot of money on hospital care for like, for homeless people and then discharge them back out onto the streets. That's got to be a crazy thing to do. It doesn't make any sense. And it's also true that, you know, hospitals have recognized this for a long time. They've always had like social workers doing discharge planning, that kind of thing. But there is this growing movement for hospitals and healthcare delivery systems to actually get involved in directly funding services that address the social determinants of health. And there was a health affairs piece not long ago that said that, you know, some number of systems are spending two and a half billion dollars a year on social services. And there is growing interest in incentivizing hospitals and healthcare systems to do exactly that. Um, you know, to put money behind this. And that's really what got Tom Diano and I, um, my co-author and I, thinking about it. I mean, if you think about it for a second, it's not entirely intuitive that if you're concerned is that we're spending too much money in our healthcare system and we want to rebalance, what we should do is expand the scope of the healthcare system. I mean, that's just that that doesn't that doesn't make obvious sense. So let me, I was actually thinking about it in preparation for our talk today, and I wanted to sort of imagine an alternative scenario, which is if those health systems that are spending two and a half billion dollars on social services would say instead, go to their state legislatures and say, you know what, we'll take a cut in our Medicaid rates as long as you promise to put that money in the state housing authority. Mm. I cannot imagine that happening, right? If the state the hospitals would, would come to the state and say, you know, instead of giving us more Medicaid money, take that money and put it into housing. I, it's not going to happen. And the reasons that it's not going to happen are, are the things that I think Tom and I are concerned about. One is that, you know, hospitals that are really dependent on Medicaid, which is where the patients face the greatest social needs, they have a lot of challenges already. They're not the ones who are spending, you know, too much money. They're not doing well on staffing. They're not doing well on nosocomial infections, surgical mortality rates. They don't have the latest technology. And their management is already strained in just trying to improve the things that they that are sort of in their in their wheelhouse, what they really should be doing, their primary mission. Cutting their Medicaid spending and diverting funds to housing is not going to make care better for their patients. Having their CEOs worrying about, you know, housing construction costs or plumbing leaks or rent checks is not a wise use of their time. So for those hospitals, I think trying to get them to focus on social needs could really be a bad distraction. And then, what, you know, what about if we think about the hospitals that are more able to do this? I think those are often academic medical centers, better resourced hospitals. They have staff, they have management capacity. They don't have as many patients with significant social needs. But there, I think the problem is that the objectives and the expertise is really not focused on issues around social needs. They have teaching missions. They want to attain clinical excellence. They want to be on the top of the U.S. news rankings. They, they might cut a lot of ribbons, but investing in social needs is just not top of mind for them. It's not going to be the way it is for the people in the housing agency or the food bank um, that, you know, where that's what they do. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, and then, so what happens if they do do it? Like, mm -hmm. do we have any reason to believe that the way they're going to invest in social needs will be the way we would want to? Mm -hmm. um, well, that's a great, yeah, that's a great question. Thanks, Sherry. Um, I'm sorry. Great way to delve into this. I'd love to hear um, uh, Seth and Stacy, your thoughts as practicing physicians um, whose careers have have focused a lot on addressing social needs. I'm curious to hear kind of your perspectives in reaction to, to Sherry's um, interesting and important thoughts. Seth, you want to go first? Oh, OK, um, sure. So I so I, I really enjoyed um, the <clears throat> excuse me the piece that Dr. Glead um, and her co-author wrote and, and I share a lot of these concerns. I think they're very reasonable ones, and I think it's very good that we're having this conversation. Um, to me, uh, as a as a you know, and maybe this is rooted in um, in my work as a primary care doctor, or maybe just sort of how I see things. But to me, the 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 key point in deciding whether um, you know a social service program of some sort um, might be brought. Um, uh, into the, the healthcare system or funded through healthcare in some way 
is um, is whether what you're trying to do with it falls into the the sort of activities that in general fall under healthcare, meaning management of sort of specific clinical conditions. And and for me, I think there's a there's an analogy I sometimes use um, that that's helpful. So um, you know, think of the fact that we know that exercise is good for health um, overall. I think that's you know kind of inarguable. Everybody everyone knows this. Everyone knows that we don't do enough of it. Um, but but exercise can mean many things. And and while I don't think that the healthcare system should you know say pay for everyone's gym membership or pay for upkeep of public parks or something like that, even though those are good things that that could promote health in some ways. There are, are maybe other ways that, that we might bring this in um, uh, to it. So think about, you know, a specific type of exercise program like physical therapy after knee surgery. Having that be paid for through the healthcare system, you know, having some arrangements with physical therapists, possibly even employing physical therapists, um, because you're managing a particular clinical situation, um, that that makes sense. And in fact, you know, it, it's it's commonly accepted now that most forms of health insurance will cover um, physical therapy in, in with certain clinical indications and those kinds of things. And, and overall, I think we can think of programs to address health related needs in, in kind of the same way. So there might be sort of general public health nutrition programs or general social health policy programs to prevent food insecurity. Um, that that the healthcare system doesn't need to get involved with. We might not need the healthcare system to be involved with the National School Lunch Program or SNAP or anything like that. Um, but at the same time, and as a primary care doctor, if I have a patient whose blood sugar is out of control because of their food insecurity, um, having a having a program that can help provide healthy food in the context of overall diabetes management, I think could be helpful. Or at least we could we could study it and and see if it's helpful. And if it is, um, think a think of a way of integrating that into healthcare. So that that's kind of the the branch point that I go down, um, you know, is, is this program involved in clinical management in some way? Is clinical expertise um, involved? And if it is, then, then you know, um, maybe examining whether it can be um, covered under healthcare makes sense to me. If not, then there's probably less reason to have healthcare involved. Hmm. Interesting. Stacy. Well, I'll, I'll bring a couple, I think, complementary perspectives, and and I echo uh, Seth's point. You know, I'm happy that we have this piece to talk about, and we ought to be rigorously examining what we do and why we do it. Um, that's critical at the policy level, the practice, the science level, and and so thank you, Siren, for hosting us to have this conversation. I'll answer. You know, I, 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 yes, I'm a. I'm going to answer as a clinician. Okay, I am also a scientist and an entrepreneur. I wear different hats, but I'm going to answer as a clinician. I've been working on the ground in a variety of healthcare organizations since the late 1990s, actually, even earlier because my father was a physician and my grandma and I helped run his front desk. I filed the paper charts, you know, so I've been working in sole um, private practice. I've worked in community health centers and student care, academic medical centers, VA hospitals, and you know, I'm sure Seth also has worked in a variety of settings. Um, currently, I'm a gynecologist. I've been working on the south side of Chicago for nearly 25 years, taking mo care mostly of people, women with cancer. Um, our academic medical center, like many, is an anchor institution. It's one of the largest employers, if not the largest employer in a geography that's 120 square miles and a, and a million people, mostly predominantly African-American and Black people. So I want to make two points wearing that hat. Number one, healthcare has always been in the business of social care. George Engel, 1977, published in Science, the biopsychosocial model for medicine. And the, um, his, his statement was that the dominant model of disease today is biomedical. It leaves no room in its framework for social, psychological, and behavioral dimensions of illness. A biopsychosocial model is proposed that provides a blueprint for research, teaching, and design for action in the real world. I was schooled on the biopsychosocial model, and I've always conducted myself in my one-to-one, -one, uh, I always is a strong word, I aspire, like many of us practicing medicine, to conduct ourselves in one-to-one -one fashion with patients that understands our patients as whole people with bio, psycho, and social needs and issues, all of which come together to determine their health. So I want to just make that as a framing point. It's not new. And when George Engel talked about biopsychosocial, he was even reflecting back onto the origins of medicine, which happened mostly at home and was largely palliative or psychosocial in nature. The other example I want to give reflects on the structure, the building in which I work and where, where my lab sits. It's called the Chicago Lying-In Hospital. 
lying in L-Y-I-N-G hyphen in. The structure was built at the turn of the 19th century, and it's the place where pregnant women or people went on, uh, went to uh, on their estimated date of confinement to get ready to have a baby. The hospital basically built a house as an alternative to what was considered the dirty homes of poor women to um, keep them safe from infection until they could deliver their babies. And initially this effort, which was led in part by Joseph Boulevard de Lee, an obstetrician, um, was intended to improve maternal and neonatal mortality um, among women living in poverty, but ultimately turned out to be an, an intervention that worked well, lifted everybody up. And then over time, even affluent women or women of means would come into the lying in hospital and have their babies there. And this did have impact on maternal and infant mortality. So I just think it's an interesting reflection when we think about whether hospitals or health systems should be in the business of housing. Hospitals themselves are housing to some degree. I don't wanna go too far in giving these examples, but I do want to have us acknowledge that although we have new technologies, new science, new policy to help us think about social care, it's something we've been doing for a very long time. We've just done it ineffectively. It's only recently that we've bought, brought modern tools of technology and policy to social care. So we can now see it, we can quantify it, we can ask, are we doing it well? How can we do it better? And these systems and technologies are giving us new insights, not just to what's happening inside the four walls of healthcare, but how things are working in our communities. And so that's where I see value. Um, and I just wanted to put those other ideas out into this conversation. Yeah, thank you, Stacy. That's so interesting to think about the roots of this and how uh, it's perhaps been something that medicine has been doing for a long time in some ways. Um, it feels to me like um, one of the questions here, there's, there's kind of two pieces to this. One is around kind of what Seth, you were talking about this idea of the place where clinical expertise can particularly be helpful, which seems like maybe like somewhat of a no brainer. And then there's this other bigger piece around the funding. Um, and I'm curious, I mean, having started out this webinar, Sherry, with acknowledging that like we have maybe not enough funding on the side of social services in this country compared to other um, wealthy countries. Um, I, get, I, I completely get the idea that you don't want somebody with medical expertise running housing programs because what do they know? Um, but if, the, you know, what's your, I'm curious if we could explore about around this idea, like, isn't it good that health systems are using money that they have? We know that the healthcare sector has more money than the social services sector. Isn't it good that some of it may be then getting redistributed to social services through, you know, if, if we're not able to accomplish that through political means, this is kind of a backdoor way, potentially. What, what's the danger there that you're particularly worried about, Sherry? So I think there are two challenges that that are that are that happen in that way. The first one is that medical needs are only one of the needs people have. They're only one of the reasons that we have a social service sector. And and I would be a little bit concerned. And and I think it's a, it's a really challenging problem if our housing services, for example, were allocated primarily on the basis of the medical needs of the people with housing who, who need housing. So imagine there are many reasons people need housing. Like one is one is that housing will reduce their medical costs, but another is that it will help their kids go to a stable school or let them keep a job. Um, the healthcare system might not prioritize the distribution of social services in the way that is optimal for our society. So that is one concern. If we prioritize the allocation of social services exclusively through their impact on health, I don't know that that is the right way to do it. So one concern is there. The second concern is a more nasty one, right? I don't trust the healthcare sector. You know, I, I think it is, I think what's going to, it's all very well to say that they're going to take their current money and re redeploy it um, on, you know, social services. But I think there's every reason to believe that if we actually did that over time, they would start asking for more money because after all, we're providing people with housing. So 
let's increase our Medicaid payments so that we can provide people with housing. And then how do I know that the money that I've now given them to provide housing is actually going to go into housing and not into the latest PET scanner or something or other? Because after all, their healthcare systems, they are run by physicians, people who care about health, people who find technology exciting. They, the highest paid people in healthcare systems are not the social workers who do discharge planning. I'm sorry to say that. They're, you know, the, the top surgeons who bring in the brain transplant people, whatever, um, right? Uh, and, and that political economy is not going to change. And so I really worry that we are going to wind up in a, in a situation where we're not going to be doing the best we can with our social service spending. We'll delude ourselves into believing that we are achieving something. And in the end, we're not going to get what we want. Um, mm -hmm. That's, I mean, I'm very cynical. Point. I'm sorry, but I, you know, it's, You've been around the block. Reason to be cynical. I've been around. Yeah. Yeah. Seth and Stacy, any thoughts and reaction to Sherry's concerns? Well, I, I share it. I, you know, and I saw all the clapping too. So the um the emojis help us get a sense of of how everyone feels. But I sh I think those are legitimate concerns, and it I would say it's less about distrust in the healthcare system and higher trust in other systems. You're describing political economy, you know that those those principles would apply, you know, anywhere uh, in terms of how people would would go after resources if if given some they'd want more. You know, I, I guess I'll speak a little bit metaphorically here. Um, and I think I want to plug Seth's uh, new book. Seth, you can talk to us more about this, about how our government works. But, um, you know, I, I have an image when I think on this issue of a like beautiful, thriving farm with a lush ecosystem of plants and animals that supports a virtuous cycle of life. And then there are the silos. And we need silos. They hold the grain, and, but they cast long shadows on this beautiful ecosystem. Um, one day, one of these silos starts, you know, leaking toxins into the environment. And now the problem goes beyond the silo, like more funding to that vertical doesn't fully solve the problem because the, the beautiful lush ecosystem has been toxified. So I, I think that um, while, while Sherry's concerns really resonate with me, in practicality, we have a yes and problem. So we want to continue to, I think we're at a really unique time in history to experiment with policy and learn real time how our policy type experimentations play out so we can iterate them. You know, technology and neural networks and system science allows us to do experimentation with, with policy in ways we never could have imagined before. And we still have to take care of the ecosystem. You know, people have to eat and drink the milk and the water. Um, so from my perspective, we should both be alert to and thinking fast and critically about our policy innovations, but we should continue to innovate while we do the things we can do. Everybody in the ecosystem, healthcare and housing included, do the things that we can do to, to keep to keep the system alive, to, to respond to the crisis that is, you know, the toxic, the toxic waste. Um, so it's a yes and in my view. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Seth, do you want to add anything? You know, I don't I don't have too much to to add here. I completely agree with um with the concerns Sherry raised, and I completely um agree with, with Stacy's point about you know needing to act and do something when it's done there. I, I mean, the only thing I would I would reiterate, I you know, I, I don't want and I don't think anyone on this call wants and, and probably there, I don't even think there are people, you know, out there who want the majority of our social policy or public policy to be run through healthcare or to be done, um, you know, uh, decisions to be made solely on the basis of um, of promoting health. I think the far and away the bulk of all this stuff, you know, uh, should should uh, doesn't need to to mix with the healthcare sector. I think the I think the piece that's interesting though is you know in those situations where there where there really is um, a good rationale for involving both clinical and social service expertise to improve you know some particular outcomes maybe health outcomes or maybe even beyond um, health outcomes. Um, you know, is that an opportunity worth pursuing? And then if it is, you know, if, you, if you're saying you want to do something, then you need to think about how to finance it. And so how should that financing run? And maybe the way the financing should run is not through the healthcare system, completely open to that and, and share um, 
you know, a lot of uh, of skepticism and pessimism about the way that that American healthcare um, works and financing and and um, you know large healthcare systems as um, not always benign um, actors in our political economy. Um, so uh, so definitely share all those concerns. But I but I also do think there may be some opportunities um, to uh, to sort of collaborate and improve health in the right circumstances. Mm. So. Can I just do a shout out for a second, Carolyn, to Siren and some of the work that other people are doing in this space? So I, I think there are a couple of things to keep in mind. I think I would really reiterate Seth's point that there are some situations, and we've already seen some of them, I would say tr taking care of lead poisoning in kids, like doing housing inspections for kids who have high lead levels in their in their blood. That seems like a really obvious place where that interaction between the healthcare system and the social service system seems exactly on point, right? You can there's a real gain there and it's obvious. I think the silo point is also true. Part of the reason we may have this imbalance is because we don't count the benefit, the savings in the healthcare system, if they exist, from investing in some of the social services. I would also say we don't actually know very much about that. I mean, we have a strong belief that if we spent more on social services, we would reduce our healthcare spending. But the evidence base is crummy. Um, and we haven't really done the benefit cost analysis. We haven't figured out that we could raise, we could in fact reduce Medicaid spending and increase housing spending and wind up with healthier people. That exercise has not been done. And Siren and places like it that are doing that, I think are really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if I, could, if I could just add one point, um, you know, building here. As a healthcare provider, or as a health system delivering healthcare, if, if lack of housing precludes me from delivering cancer treatment, I'm going to find a way to house. You know, think of the Ronald McDonald houses on our campuses that house families for children who are having cancer treatment. If lack of transportation precludes me from delivering dialysis, I'm going to figure out a way to transport. I am deal I am caring for you behind a closed door and my job is you first. And I'm going to do those things while you figure out how to govern at the, at the federal level and at the state level and at the institutional level and how health systems and community-based organizations are going to get along and here the I in this case I'm the doctor who has an obligation to the individual. Um so yeah. this is what I mean by yes and, and we can't be ignorant. Resources are incredibly scarce. Um, what I'm trying to convey though, is what I know to be the, the deep moral distress and frustration of those of us on the front, front line who are first obligated to the individual. And we have to acknowledge that is no matter how strong the boundaries or thick the walls between healthcare and housing, we will do whatever we can and need to do in the moment to alleviate suffering. That will not go away unless we have robots delivering healthcare, which we may very well have sometime soon. So we have to design our policies and our, our, our we have to innovate in government um, and, and innovate in resource allocation recognizing that ultimately human beings are taking care of human beings and making decisions about resource allocation uh, at, at the micro level at the same time as we work on the macro. Mm. Yeah, and that relates to a question I feel like I, I want to ask you, Sherry, your thoughts. Like um, you're, um, you know, you're pushing back, I think, on a movement that's been happening in healthcare, right? And a whole set of policies that are happening. In your ideal world, um, what would be happening to because and and those policies are coming from a place in healthcare of I think as Stacy said a lot of frontline providers really frustrated that they're not able to provide the kind of care that they want to provide because there are all these um, socioeconomic needs that interfere that make it uh, challenging to be able to help um, heal people. Um, what What's the alternative that you see as a feasible and preferable alternative? I'm curious. So I am very sympathetic to the challenges of the frontline healthcare workers. And I do think that we, we I mean, I, you know, it isn't usually the physician who is who is arranging the housing. There, There is like, 
we do have discharge planners. It's not like we've not, I think to reiterate, reiterate Stacy's point, we have been in this business of connecting people to services for a long time. That is not a new thing and it shouldn't be a new thing. The real thing that has changed is the interest of healthcare systems in actually doing these things themselves. That's where that two and a half billion dollars that people are accounting for is. It's not just connecting people to nutrition or making a referral to PT. That's not the issue here. The issue is, do we actually want to encourage hospitals and healthcare systems to be in the business of delivering the social determinants of health? That I think is a much more challenging problem. And, and, and I think particularly because I think the money will follow that activity and not in a good way. Mm -hmm. So um, I would prefer to think about, you know, I think uh, Stuart Butler has all, has talked about trusted community hubs. Um, you could think about different ways of making those referrals, of, ad, of advocating for the strength of those referrals, for advocating for the strength of those institutions, um, and doing your own business as well as you can. You know, it, it, there's also an element of this, I'm gonna be really a little bit, it is not always the places that are providing the best care to their vulnerable patients that are, that are the ones who are talking about this. Um, and there's a certain element of like, do the thing you know how to do better before you start complete, before you start expanding the scope of what you do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that dovetails with, uh, one of the comments in the chat where somebody brought up, you know, what do patients actually want? Um, some of the, um, uh, research that I've read about patient perspectives, I, I definitely have, have heard that, you know, like in a certain sense, uh, patients, I, I think, want their clinicians to, there's a lot of complaints about the healthcare sector. We don't have a perfect um, healthcare uh, services environment at all, uh, particularly for individuals um, with limited incomes. And so that, that makes a lot of sense. I'm curious on a policy side, one of the other comments in the chat, the Q&A, and please continue putting your questions in the Q&A, um, was um, around um, the tax free status of nonprofit hospitals. Um, so here we have nonprofit hospitals who don't get taxed and then they use, you know, some of their funds, as you mentioned, that, that uh, two and a half million that's going then towards, you know, supporting community services. It's kind of a roundabout way. Why not have hospitals actually be taxed? Um, they are largely, you know, profit making, you know, they operate as profit making enterprises for the most part, or as, oper you know, entities that are seeking to maximize um, the bottom line. Let's tax them. And then we have, um, you know, elected governments um, deciding how to spend that money instead of government officials. Um, what do people think about that? I know it's not necessarily quite feasible. Who knows, you know, uh, how political feasible that is. But putting that aside, um, what are thoughts about that? I mean, I think I think the community benefit policy is a very important one to surface here. We it's amazing we've gotten this far and haven't talked about value based care, and and I think value based care in in addition to community benefit policy and the the effect of the Affordable Care Act on how people are interpreting and applying these policies is very important to consider. In Leora Horowitz's paper, uh, Health Affairs, where this 2.5 billion number, I think, originates, and I appreciate Leora and her team for doing that, that hard work, um, you know, I think I come away with an understanding that much of the investment that health systems are making in what we might call social care or under the umbrella of social determinants of health does get attributed at least in part to community benefit spending. And still it is a tiny fraction. I can't remember if it was 130th or 160th or something of total community benefit spend, most of which goes to offset costs of caring for people who can't afford to pay for care. Um, so 2.5 billion is a big number. We'd all love to have that number in our bank account and a uh, small fraction of overall community benefit spend. Having said that, I do think both value-based care business models and concern about losing 501c3 nonprofit status do drive health system behavior around investment um, in communities, which has largely been political investment, largely motivated by an anchor institution looking at who are its important constituents in the community where they reside and making investments based on uh, relationships rather than 
real evidence of impact and outcomes. We're now though in a place with technology and with technology that connects healthcare to social and human services organizations to really understand which organizations are doing what work best and where could these community investments be made more strategically. Um, so yeah, should hospitals all be, uh, should we let the tax, the, the tax system solve for all of this? I will leave that to, to Sherry and Seth, but I do think it's very important to think of, to understand why we where why we are where we are today in part in the context of, of value based payment and also mm -hmm. uh, community benefit roles. Well, that's a good segue. Also, Seth, um, you had a piece recently, a really interesting piece, making a distinction between kind of our current approach of multi sector collaboration um, versus. Um, uh, doing work that actually changes the conditions themselves. I think that's the crux of what we're talking about here. Uh, can you say a little bit more about that distinction that you were um, trying to make and what you see as the role of healthcare professionals potentially in um, having more of a role, is there a role for the healthcare sector in having a bigger role in addressing the adverse conditions themselves? Yeah, thanks. Um, so yeah, so the the distinction, um, so the 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 uh, piece Caroline was mentioning um, was in um, Millbank Quarterly uh, in um, January. It's called um, multi sector collaboration versus social democracy. And the 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 tension that I was trying to to draw out there is that um, you know I think a lot of these efforts that that we're talking about, and I think is the theme that's come up from all of uh, of the discussions at some point today. Is that you know the the these programs to address say housing instability or food insecurity or things like that um, are essentially trying to mitigate the consequences of adverse social conditions, um, but they're not necessarily really aimed at um, transforming the reasons that those conditions exist in the first place, or in particular, they're not you know really aimed at establishing um, social equality. And so when you have social inequality that gets embodied as health inequality, and then when clinicians see that, you uh, as um, as Stacey was saying very eloquently, you know you want to do something about it. Um, and, and maybe even um, more cynically, um, so it, it's not just that like this happened and people want to respond to it, but there there can almost be a sense in which um, the uh, addressing, you know, sort of mitigating these consequences in some ways um, is only occurring because there's very little appetite to to change things more substantively. And so what I was um, talking about in that piece as um, as social democracy. Um, was sort of a, a political project that seeks um, democratic, meaning like egalitarian rather than hierarchical relationships in civil, political and economic institutions, with the idea being that if we focused on policies that make people substantively uh, equal within a system of social relations, then you don't get the social conditions that create the food insecurity and these other things. And so rather than trying to mitigate every single instance of um, social inequality being embodied as poor health, you know, sort of after the fact or as it's already occurred, you might instead focus on egalitarian social policy to prevent the health harming social needs from occurring in the first place. Um, Stacey was sort of kind enough to mention earlier, so I, I, I have a book coming out called Equal Care that'll be out um, next month that that talks in a lot more detail, um, uh, uh, at least around my opinion of, of how we might use social policy more broadly and sort of outside of healthcare. So thinking in terms of um, civil, political and economic institutions, how we might do things to make people um, substantively equal, you know, have, have our material conditions reflect their fundamental moral equality and how that might uh, keep people out of the health harming situations that we so often find people in. My thoughts about that? Yeah. I I um I just want to make a, like a, a meta observation very very quickly, which is I imagine that part of what enables Seth to get to the point of writing about social democracy as a potential solution to the problems we're talking about here is the accumulation of the observations at the, the very micro and then probably intermediate and more macro through his research levels, um, uh, the accumulation of observations about the, the social inequities that drive health. 
And, and I want to just use that to say one of the benefits, and I, I don't hear Sherry disagreeing with this, and actually I think I hear quite a bit of consensus about, you know, sort of the extremes, like where should healthcare definitely not be, and where could it make a lot of sense for healthcare to be, like, observing the problems, the social problems that really directly drive health, and making use of that information to advocate, whether it's for more resources or for governance change, you know, for social policy. So I think there's a reasonable consensus that being, that healthcare being in that realm and doing the things we've always done better with more transparency, with more data could be useful both for individual patient care, better healthcare delivery, and also for advocacy and even all the way to the level of what our governance um, should look like. I wanted to make a second point, which comes back to Europe and, and Sherry's opening comments. And I think I saw a comment from Greg Bloom about this. I see two, I've seen two different examples in Europe of social care that, that have interested me. One is social prescribing. So that term social prescribing actually was one of the earliest um, practical terms I heard in the social care field when I started this work more than 10 years ago. And I think is an extension to some degree of Michael Marmot's work and the Whitehall studies, this idea that there was room in the regular practice of healthcare to connect people meaningfully to important social services. The other example, I think, is on the end of where we don't necessarily think healthcare should be, but in certain instances, it might make perfect sense. I was in a hospital in Dublin, Ireland, and my colleagues showed me the grocery store that had been opened on the main floor of the hospital. And why was this a good thing? Well, it attracted people to get their health care. It was convenient for people. It was good for the employees to have an, a grocery store on site. Now, the hospital wasn't operating the grocery store. They leased space to somebody who did. You know, so um, do I think hospitals should use Medicaid dollars to be in the business of profiting from selling groceries? <laughs> no. Could there be some good arguments for why having on-site food pantries to alleviate the suffering from hunger among people who have to make life and death decisions for their child who's sick in the hospital? Yes, possibly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. We're seeing a lot of um, questions in the chat around kind of distinguishing between social risks, social needs, and social determinants of health. And then even within social determinants, like ways in which that term gets used sometimes to mean actually things that are very individual and that you might think of as more social risks versus kind of larger social factors. I wonder if any of you want to comment on the importance of distinguishing between those terms and what that means in terms of the potential role of the healthcare sector um, around those issues. Carolyn, I'm really sorry I got distracted by the questions. Distinguishing between social risks and so social, social risks, social needs, and social determinants of health. Yeah. And does that help us in thinking about the roles of the so the healthcare sector that make the most sense? I think I'll give you my sort of go oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, please. So yes, I mean the my, the way I think about it in general is often a, a sort of you know micro versus macro um, distinction, or you know so I, I think of um, social risks or social needs as sort of individual level manifestations of um, uh, what is then determined by social determinants of health or social drivers or sort of more structural macro level um, forces. So the, the, say the distribution of, um, a health related social need like food insecurity is determined by an array of, um, policies, structures, institutions, things like that. I think what, um, healthcare to date has mostly done is respond to individual level health related social needs, try to address them at the individual level. Um, I think there's, um, uh, important debate as to whether um, the most uh, effective way to address health-related social needs is through, you know, taking them on in an individual way or um, sort of addressing the the more structural factors that cause them. And then if you think the latter, I think there's also debate about, you know, how and whether healthcare systems might get involved in pushing for the institutional or policy changes that would really affect that. None of the programs that I think we're talking about here, I think, are about that likely to affect social determinants broadly. They, they're responding to needs once once they occur, but are not sort of affecting that. I did see a comment in the chat that that seemed to imply that I said uh, physicians uh, should should stay in our lane and not um, address these issues, which uh, I 
felt called to respond to that's not not what i actually think um but um but i do i do think that the individual level versus you know structural or more sort of policy level distinction is important but there may be roles for um for you know trying to address um these problems at both of those levels so on the individual level i think that's a place where actually we could use more evidence. Um, I think we have put a lot of faith in this idea that moving to value-based healthcare is actually going to encourage the health system to intervene on those individual social needs at that level. We actually don't have a great evidence base suggesting that it's going to save money in the way that the value-based model suggests. And I think that's actually a bad way to think about those interventions. Um, I, I really worry that we might wind up saying, I really worry that the following scenario could occur. We might study the effect of housing on health and discover that actually providing people with housing does not reduce their health care expenditures. I think that's actually quite likely. Um, you know, it makes them better off. It might make even make them a little bit healthier, um, although possibly in ways that are hard to measure, but it doesn't actually reduce their health care spending. Would that lead us to spend less money on housing? That would be a terrible outcome, right? Um because we think that there are lots of reasons to be doing housing that are not related to health. So I, I also don't want us to get us into this box that we really start thinking about social needs pr primarily through the lens of health. I also worry that, um, that's kind of a funny thing because traditionally doctors are not particularly liberal people and they have not been great advocates for things that would help with the social determinants of health with, you know, with, with definite, uh, 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 people on the, on the call are, are very different from that, but that, but you know, that, that it's not like the, American the medical profession has been a great advocate of spending more money on uh, social welfare. Um, uh, so, so I also worry that the part of social needs that walks into a hospital is not most of it or most of what we care about. And, and I would be really, it would be unfortunate if we thought that by putting food pantries in hospitals, I mean, we should put, food, I don't mean that it's a bad idea to put food pantries in hospitals. It's a lovely idea. It's a great idea. But if you think that that is actually making a difference to food insecurity in a community, um, you know, you're barking up the wrong tree. Most people in the community are not going to make it into the hospital. You don't want them to be in the hospital. So I, I also worry that we might mislead ourselves in thinking that by addressing the social needs that appear in medical practice, we're making a particularly important um intervention with respect to social needs and the population as a whole. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'd love yeah. to, well, go ahead, Stacey. Well, I would say, I would say I agree with that. It, it, you know, we're, there's sort of a Band-Aid approach and there's a cure approach, but if somebody's hemorrhaging, you got to stop them. You need to give them the Band-Aid for right. sure. Like it's a nice <laughs> idea. I think it's a great thing, but like, okay. let's just be very careful here about, I, I don't want to close the food pantry. I don't want to close the Ronald the wrong McDonald house. All of that is good, but Let's not pretend that we're that what we're doing here is is really addressing the the, the underlying problems. Yeah, so I, I absolutely one hundred percent agree um, with that, and and there probably is some of that pretending uh, going on. Um, I, I'll give a. I just wanted to give a little bit of a different way of thinking about what I think we keep saying, um, and back to social prescribing in in our thinking about what is the role of the healthcare system in addressing social needs we drew from a medicine e-prescribing framework. So this came from uh, uh, California Healthcare Foundation, uh, I think it was Peter Kilbridge, uh, an e-prescribing framework published in 2001. And just very briefly, what are the steps to get from the doctor's office to a prescription medicine? There's diagnosis, there's some education with the patient, there's some decision-making that's made, at the clinical encounter, a prescription is written. The prescription then has to be filled with, which involves some kind of evaluation and dispensing, and then it has to be administered. And then somebody has to eventually ask the patient, did you take your medicine? There's like no, um, you know, right now we're not, we're not monitoring the pills inside your gastrointestinal system to know if you took it or not. This framework I think is useful for thinking about what is perhaps the, uh, a role for the healthcare system today that makes better what we've always been doing. And that is, oh, I, you are struggling to get enough food for you and your family to eat. And I'm sending you home from the hospital with instructions to take medicines that require food or with instructions to do things that are going to be an alternative expense for your household to, that, to, that are gonna make it harder to get food. 
So let's talk about this. Let's adjust our care if we need to, to make it more realistic for you to do it. Let's educate you. Let's have some shared decision-making about what we can do. And then let's prescribe or connect or give you information about other resources outside the walls of the healthcare system that you and your family can draw on to live with this illness, to recover from this illness, and to get back to work and school and life. All of that other stuff, the picking up of the drug from the pharmacy, the, the taking of the drug, the getting it refilled, all of that help it, happens outside the healthcare system. And so while we're asking these really important questions about policy and resource distribution, I think we still have reason to try to understand what can, what can and already does happen inside the healthcare system? How can it happen better? How can it produce data that we can use to inform um, policy and practice outside the four walls and inside? Um, that's, that's been a really practical, useful framework for us as uh -huh. we've thought about how to solve these problems uh -huh. in our community. Well, I want to recognize all the amazing questions and points that are being made in the q and I'm sorry, we're not going to get to all of them. Um, but we'll try to we'll try to save them all and send them all back out so that folks can see all those great points. Um, I think we have time for maybe one um, before um, uh, one or two more questions. One that's coming up a lot is around the role of uh, physicians, um, of healthcare um, professionals in advocating for change. You know, Sherry, you gave that example earlier of the health systems. I mean, there are health systems through the Healthcare Anchor Network that do go advocate on the Hill for how for more investments mm -hmm. in housing. They're not specifically yep. saying like take money out of our budget and give it to housing, but they're saying we need more investments in housing. So we're seeing some of that. Is it possible that um, this increased focus on social needs in the healthcare sector may lead to more pressure? Um, even if it's not through direct advocacy on policy makers around social services, um, any of you guys seeing evidence for that or other ways that that, that could be um, facilitated and supported? We're seeing a lot of questions so, around that. So I think that recognizing that social needs can affect people's health and, and even health expenditures. So you don't, I don't, think you will save money by housing people. I, I think that, that that probably isn't true. But it probably, um, if you think about the gain in, in like quality adjusted life or whatever you want to think about it, if you want to gain in welfare from housing a person, some of that gain, some and the cost of housing that person, some of that gain does take the form of healthcare. And probably we can actually think about the budget for housing and it and our our kind of cost benefit analysis of it would say we should put more money into housing if we take into account the impacts that housing does have on health, right? Even if they aren't enough, they are still positive and they should be thought of as offsetting whatever other costs. And and so I think that recognition can help at least municipal governments. We have in New York had examples of like let's let's spend some money renovating buildings because maybe part of the cost of it, a little bit of it, will be offset in the healthcare system. Um, I don't, I don't think this is the great social movement that Seth would like to see. Um, but I also think there is some space for incremental gain. And I would say on that front, like some one of the things that states are doing is using Medicaid money through, say, managed care, not through healthcare systems, not, but through payment systems. That seems like a an, an easier lift in some sense, because they're not actually in the business of delivering anything. So you'd make a distinction, Sherry. I think that's a really important point between the idea of healthcare dollars flowing, uh, dollars flowing through a managed care or a health payer, and going to a social service organization versus going to a to a healthcare organization. Right. That's what you're saying. I, I think the yeah. thing that we are particularly yeah. worried about is is you know the hospital, the the big, the, the hospital and the healthcare system as opposed to payers. Where I think yeah, we might we might or we might not want to devolve more of our social spending to intermediaries, but um, and, you know, we could have a whole debate about that, but, but that is a different, that's a very different story. Yeah. I think that's yeah. a really useful point. I'm glad you made it. One of the things that um, somebody in the chat pointed out is that then that, that becomes a little bit hard because um, plans are very, very much thinking about healthcare costs, right? So it kind of feeds into that concern around this being framed entirely into cost, into cost. But we have just five more minutes, and I thought we would end with just asking each of you what you 
what would you would recommend uh, to policymakers going forward? Uh, there's obviously a lot uh, already happening in this space. As some folks in the chat have said, like the train has kind of left the station. Um, and I'm curious um, what you would say, given where we are now, uh, to CMS around what they should be doing around Medicaid, um, allowing Medicaid funds to be spent on social services, what you'd say to CMS around kind of their quality metrics or other uh, institutions um, that are driving policy change in this space. Anybody wanna go first? So I would make a case for do, thinking or across silos about the benefits of investing in different programs. So really taking that cross cross area approach and thinking about the well-being of people rather than thinking about their health, their housing, their education, and so on, and seeing whether we can make more sensible policy moves in that way. So it would be CMS, go talk to HUD, go talk to right. DOT, and think about more about what how these things- Graded funding or mm -hmm. blended funding, but also, mm -hmm. and research that backs that up to talk about what the right way to do this is, right? I, so I noticed that in the chat, there are people, there are UBI advocates in there and I don't wanna, I don't wanna throw away that idea. We don't, mm -hmm. we, I don't know what the right way to do this is. Yeah, yeah. Seth or Stacy, last thoughts? Well, I will give Seth the last word. So I, I would iterate, I would reiterate, and I think it fits perfectly with Sherry's point. We academics, and people with expert experience by lived experience can partner with policymakers to ensure that these experiments are well designed. Effective policies should survive, ineffective policies should fail fast and produce knowledge that can inform the next round of policymaking. And as I said before, the optimist in me feels hopeful that we are really at a serious inflection point where information technology, system science, data liberation, implementation science, community engaged research are maturing, if not matured to the point where we really can use data-driven approaches to governing. So uh, that that's my hope for the future. And I'm excited to read Seth's book to see how we, how we use all those technologies to bring his ideas to life. Yeah, I mean, I'll just end by saying, um, and I mean, I think I think Sherry made this point as well. But I mean, your your framing of it, Caroline, um, you're around what would you say to CMS? I almost sort of want to reject the premise in some way and and say, you know, maybe CMS is not the folk the folks to be talking to. I mean, I do think there's a lot we could do to make healthcare better, but fundamentally, I think the issues that drive population health and health equity um, are are not influenced by healthcare anywhere near um, to the extent that, that we give it attention to. And so I think if we fundamentally want to improve population health and health equity in the U.S., then we need to be thinking, um, you know, in, in the sphere of civil rights, in the sphere of political rights, in the sphere of economic and distributive institutions and those kinds of things. That doesn't mean that um, people in healthcare, because of the expertise they've developed in understanding what produces health and how injustice harms health, can't um, offer insights in, into how to do that better. But but fundamentally, I think the view needs to be, um, you know, healthcare is sort of a small piece, um, but uh, but but much much broader and, and really with the emphasis in in other areas. Great. Well, thank you so much. It's a great place to end. Thank you so much to the three of you for tackling this really uh, challenging, very broad um, and uh, very uh, nuanced uh, topic. Thanks to all of you who joined us for your comments. Again, we'll share the, um, the slides and the recording and also the, um, the Q&A questions. And wanna just give you one last reminder of our upcoming webinars. Uh, the next one will be March 11th around Simon's new conceptual model for social care. And then on April 5th, we'll be talking about the lessons from the Camden Coalition's care management model. Thank you everybody. And um, we'll now conclude the webinar. Thanks, have a really great rest of the day.